This is a conversation with Dr. Nidal Gesum. He's a professor of astrophysics at the American University of Sharjah and has a PhD in astrophysics from the University of California, San Diego. Apart from his teaching experience in UAE, Algeria, Kuwait, he's also served as a postdoc researcher at NASA and is also a member of the International Astronomical Union. In this conversation, we discuss the universe, the possibility of a creator, God, existentialism, you know, all the light topics, Mars and aliens. This is no time. If you like what you see, then do hit subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, rate five stars on Apple Podcasts, or do whatever you like on Anchor. This project always takes a lot of my time, money, and effort. When we started, I was just a five-year-old kid, and you can see the age on my face. So if you like to see it continue, then do consider making a donation on Patreon. For other forms of love and support, you can follow this channel on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, or you can follow me personally. And now... It's no time. The comedian George Carlin, he had once said that I believe I am bigger than the universe, smaller than the universe and equal to the universe. I'm bigger than the universe because I can contain it. I can define it. Everything that's within the universe, I can put that into a single thought within my mind. I'm smaller than the universe because I'm only five foot nine and 150 pounds and the universe is slightly bigger than that. And I'm equal to the universe because every atom within me is exactly the same as every atom within the universe. So building on that, I would now like to ask you, what is your relationship with the universe? When you think about it, when you study it, when you contemplate it, uh, what are the emotions that come through your mind? Are you excited by it? Are you in awe of it? Is there a part of you that's afraid of it? Are you uh, just by its mystery or its size, are you intimidated by it? What kind of emotions does the universe invoke within you? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for this opportunity and this conversation. I am excited about this dialogue. Um, and I didn't know about that uh, statement or uh, saying by George Carlin, which I find absolutely marvelous, really, really nice, well put. Um, as to me, I, I, I think it is most of the above that you mentioned, but not all of them, because I am not afraid of the universe. I am not intimidated by the universe. But I am in awe of the, of the complexity and elegance and beauty of the universe. And I am curious and I am excited and I am wondrous. And I, I am always uh, amazed by the fact that the more we discover, uh, the more we find some uh, incredible things and the more we find that there is still a lot more to discover. So I think that's sort of the relationship with the universe. Um, I agree that the universe is within us. This is true, and, uh, and so in that sense, I don't know if we can say we are greater than the universe, but the universe is definitely within us, with all its history, because as you know, the atoms and elements that we are made of were cooked in the universe from the Big Bang, the hydrogen and the helium, and some of the lithium and beryllium, to the carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, all the way to the iron that's in our blood. All of that was cooked in stars. So uh, the history of the universe is in us, for sure. The elements of the universe are in us. The um, processes that the universe functions with, electromagnetism, gravity, nuclear physics, radioactivity, all of that is in us, so that is also true. Uh, we are part of the universe and we are much smaller than the universe, physically speaking, that is true also. There is, this is pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> And I tell my students when, uh, when we start talking about the universe and cosmology and astronomy in general, I say, um, when we started to discover the size, the true size of the universe in the early 20th century, when we started to discover other galaxies, and people are amazed when they hear that we didn't know about other galaxies until the early 20th century. So until the 1920s, we thought, you know, what we see and what's out there, these stars and planets, is the entire universe. And then we realize that's only one small island among you know, zillions of islands. Now we, we used to say 100 billion uh, galaxies, each containing an average of 100 billion stars. Now we know that there are at least two, three trillion galaxies. And most of the galaxies contain hundreds of billions of stars. And most of those stars have planets around them. And so when we started to discover these numbers, you know, and whenever I mention these numbers, the students are just absolutely floored by the numbers. But then I tell them, but you know, there is, there is sort of a, a little twist to the tale in the end, something really interesting. It's like, you know, at the end of a series, and then there is a twist, something that you didn't expect, 
that just blows your mind. And what blows your mind is that we are made of the rarest elements of the universe. We, when I say we, I don't mean just humans, I mean uh, all creatures and even the earth itself. What, is, what are we made of? We're made of carbon, we're made of iron, silicon in the earth, uh, oxygen in the air, nitrogen in the air. And when you look at all of this, all of these compared to hydrogen and helium, all together they make, all together, all the carbon in the universe, not just in us and the nitrogen, and the oxygen, and the iron, and the silicon, and the aluminum, and everything that makes the, the, the ground, that makes the air, that makes um, human life, or even animals and, and plants, they make less than 1% of what's out there. So we are really made of the rarest of the, of, of the elements in the universe. And then last but not least, uh, we are alive. And so life is, is an extraordinary development in the history of the universe. We don't know when it, when it appeared first because we haven't found any other life elsewhere, even primitive life, but we know of plenty of diverse life here on Earth. So that makes life, uh, sorry, that makes Earth really an extraordinary object uh, out there. Maybe there are others, maybe there are other planets or moons that contain life, maybe similar or different type of life. But at least for the time being, and for the reason that I just mentioned, uh, we are extraordinary. So in that sense, uh, George Carlin was correct in thinking we are much smaller than the universe, but at the same time, we are equal to the universe because we contain all the elements of the universe. But at the same time, we are special in the universe because we are made of the really, really special material. If the universe was made of only hydrogen and helium, there would be no life, we know. Because helium, first of all, doesn't make uh, chemical reactions, and hydrogen is too simple to make anything complex. So we needed carbon and other elements to assemble and make atoms, and then more and more complex molecules with which you can make life, because life is a complex process, biochemical. So uh, I didn't mean to take a long time to respond to this, <laughs> but I think it is important to put all of this in context. What is astronomy? What is humanity in this immensity of, of a cosmos, of, of a universe. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of illustrate at least from that big perspective why I am in awe, why I am curious, why I am amazed, uh, and why even though, again, yes, we are only uh, a few feet tall, uh, we are extraordinarily important in this universe. It is impossible to talk shortly about the universe, the kind of excitement and intrigue and interest it brings out in all of us. It's just impossible to contain, I believe. Your, your father was a religious philosopher, your mother was into literature, and you've grown up having these dinner table conversations about religion, spirituality, ethics, politics, but you've mentioned not a lot of science. And as you grew up, naturally, you made your entire career and your work about in a way, marrying science and religion, because you've often said that these are not antagonistic fields of work. They belong together and they should move together hand in hand. And you've also said that rejection of scientific fact can be counterproductive for religious work as well. So what I want to do today is I want to take you back to your dinner table conversations of your childhood. And now I'm going to ask you the same question you might have faced back then, I hope. And now armed with your years of research, knowledge and wisdom, I would love to hear whether your answers have changed. Are they the same? I think you're the perfect person to answer these. Sounds good? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to uh, sort of preface it a little bit uh, that uh, I didn't set out to try to find this relationship between science and religion or philosophy. Um, I, from my teenage years, I, I loved science and I loved mathematics. And I thought these fields are absolutely you know, wonderful because uh, I remember one of my relatives uh, saw me sort of solving mathematical equations and said, he's playing games. And, it, and to me, it really looked like <laughs> games. You're like, you know, you have this X and you have this transformation and you do this and then abracadabra and you get a result and it's a correct result. Like, this is an amazing thing. It's like, you know, just playing Sudoku or something and in the end you solve the puzzle. Uh, and so, but it was only much later, actually, only when I started to reach the PhD level that I started to sort of look back and try to integrate all of these influences, what I learned at home, what I learned in school, what I learned at the university, the science that I learned, the research that I was doing 
uh, or beginning to do when I was a PhD student. And that's when I started to sort of ask myself, how do these things fit together or should they just be completely separate and then, you know, talk about this only at home and talk only about this at the university? Uh, or is there a way to put them all together so that my mind is all unified in a way? So that came later. So I had, you know, sort of dinner table, as you said, conversations about, you know, identity, culture, um, human endeavor, and so on. And I was having all the science at school. And then much later, it was like, okay, so how does all of this fit together? Hopefully, we'll make it all fit together in this conversation. So the first question I have for you now, taking you back to your dinner table conversations, is I believe the Arabic word for the universe is kon, which roughly translated means to exist or to be. So my first question is, where do you stand on this long debate, this boxing match? This has gone on for centuries, where in the red corner we have the universe is infinite. It has always been on an infinite continuum. There's a cyclic universe theory which says that uh, the universe has cycles of a big bang, then a big crunch, then a big bang again, and it just goes on and on and on till infinity. And then in the blue corner, we have arguments like the Kalam cosmological argument, which states that there is a point of creation, there has to be a point before this infinity, or even the design argument, which says that the universe is too beautiful, too symmetrical, too perfect, too regular to have just been come out by chance, there has to be a creator behind this or a designer behind this. And this argument then goes into there being a creator and a god and also occasionalism. So where do you stand on this long argument? Do you have a particular intuition on whether the universe is infinite or has it been created, whether the Big Bang was the point of creation? Yeah, uh, well, those are big questions among the biggest questions that there are out there, right? Um, and But those are slightly separate questions, even though obviously they relate to the universe and creator or creation and so on. But th those are slightly different questions. Let me unpack them a little bit. So as you said, the first question that has been uh, debated for centuries was, is the universe, has the universe existed for, for an infinite time? Goes back to minus infinity. Or does it, did it start at the t equals zero and there was nothing before that? Uh, and the reason why there were all these questions or debates and disagreements the blue corner versus the red corner, as you said, is because people didn't have data, and so to them, this was a philosophical question. Uh, but then, in the, um, in the early 1920s, when we discovered that the universe is expanding, and then we sort of retraced the history of the universe backward, and we realized it must have started from a point, because how could it be expanding like this? In fact, you can measure the rate of expansion, and you say, therefore, uh, a billion years ago, it was a little smaller, Five billion years ago, it was much smaller, since it is expanding at this whatever rate, and so on. And then you go back and you find that it starts from a point, and that's the Big Bang idea. You know, you start from a point, you expand, you dilute, temperature drops, you start making more elements, particles and, and atoms and molecules, and so on. And so people said, oh, clearly the data is saying that we go back, if we go back, we find that the universe started at some point. And that was sort of the end of the debate of, is it eternal, going back to minus infinity, or did it go back to t equals zero? Then people, you know, as you know, these questions never die completely. People came back and said, wait a minute, but this is our universe, and this is our bubble of the universe, if you like, but maybe beyond it, and maybe there is, you know, this sort of this big room, this big meta-universe, and then there are some explosions, local explosions. So what we are seeing is, in here, there is this Big Bang, but maybe there are other Big Bangs, and maybe there is a much better space and time where this universe exploded for whatever reason, or appeared, and then there was another one. So maybe in the end, there is this infinite universe, and what we are looking at, and what started 13.8 billion years ago, is our universe, not the entire universe. But we don't have any data on this. So, so this idea that the universe could still be infinite, and we are only expanding in our bubble. This still is logical and there is nothing wrong with it. But there is no data that confirms this. We don't know if this is really what we have. Do we have only one universe, one bubble, and there is nothingness over there? Of course, it's very hard to imagine nothingness. What do you mean nothingness? And not even space, not even time, nothing out there. Just our universe from t equals zero expanding. Or no, this is our universe which emerged for some reason, and maybe there are other bubbles in a foam like this, 
and uh, the universe is actually infinite, and what we are looking at is only our local universe. So this we don't know. This is why people talk now about a multiverse, that there, are, uh, there is this uh, infinite inflation, and these are, there are different bubbles that appear here and there from time to time. And we don't have data for this. We don't have uh, material evidence for it. But there, are some, there is some nice physics behind it that sort of makes sense. And then now the debate is, just because the physics is nice doesn't make it true. There's all kinds of, of nice science that doesn't really exist out there. Uh, just because the equations, you can put together some equations and they tell you you can have bubbles, doesn't mean that there are really bubbles. So the answer is we don't know. And, and I, tell, I tell people, the job of the scientist is not to impose my viewpoint. It's not, oh, I prefer you know, an infinite universe, so I believe in an infinite universe. Or, uh, no, I don't like this infinite universe, so I'm, I'll go with this just one unique bubble. That's our universe finished. I tell people I am okay either way. We just leave it and see how science develops. Maybe by the end of this century or next century, we will have some interesting evidence that will tell us that there is a multiverse, that there are other universes or not, or no, whatever was pointing to other universes has now fo been found to be incorrect because it had some indirect predictions that have been checked and found to be in, uh, incorrect. So we don't know. So on this infinite universe, non-infinite universe, I am sort of uh, open-minded. I, I don't know. And, and, and it doesn't matter to me either way. Uh, by the way, both ways and through the centuries with the debates of all the philosophers, from Plato and Aristotle all the way to uh, Averroes, Ibn Rushd, my favorite Muslim philosopher, and beyond, uh, there were people who believed in one or the other while still believing that there is a God behind it. So the fact that the universe could be infinite and we have a bubble, or the universe is just unique, there is nothing else out there, Either way, you can argue for a God. Uh, so it, it's not like, oh, if you believe this, then you are with God. If you don't believe this, if you believe this, then you have you know, dropped the uh, creator idea. Either way can be, uh, can be argued. As we know from the history, and there were you know, very, very hard debates on this. Now, on the design argument, the design argument also has evolved interestingly. What is the design argument, first of all? People for centuries and centuries looked at the marvels of nature around us. They look at the eye, they look at animals, they look at you know, insects, and they look at uh, our organs, they look at flowers, they look at some you know, amazing animals that look like a flower, but they are animals, and vice versa. And they say, how, can, how could this have happened just by itself like this? This is just no way. Somebody must have designed it. It's just like if I show you, you know, a piece of really well-made machinery, some sophisticated engine or motor or, you know, camera or something. And I say, you know, it just made itself like that. You know, it just evolved like that. And people said, there's no way. Anything so complex and sophisticated must have been designed by, designed by a creator. Then, of course, as you know, came Darwin. And Darwin showed that there is a process by which you can show that the simplest forms can evolve step by step over long periods of time and give you a diversity, a tree of life of all kinds of complex organisms, animals, trees, um, plants, humans, whatever, and all of that can start with a very simple form. So just because you have complexity, it doesn't mean they were designed that way. So there was a process of evolution and it produced all of this. Then the debate changed into, yes, but these, uh, laws of the universe, the processes, the physical, chemical, biological processes that have produced all this complex and wonderful diversity of life, uh, where did this come from? How come quantum mechanics and electromagnetism and the chemical reactions and all of this are so well adjusted together that they really produce all of this? Then, of course, we had the fine-tuning argument. We had the anthrop uh, anthropic argument, anthropic principle. And people said, you see, the universe could have only produced complex objects, even a star and a planet, which in itself is a complex thing. Because if you look at a star like the sun, I mean, it's a nuclear, a nuclear um, uh, engine in the core. Reactor. The core is, yeah. is a nuclear reactor. And it produces this energy. And there is you know, this 
radiative process and convective process and there's magnetic fields and it rotates and it produces energy and it is so finely balanced because there must be equilibrium between the energy you produced from within and the gravity that is trying to you know crush it down and then the earth and it has you know the core and the mental and the magma and and the tectonic plates and, and it is even leaving aside all of life you look at just the star and the planet and it is complex and in fact people have come out and realized that if electromagnetism and gravity did not have these specific forms and values you would not even have stars let alone planets let alone you know atmosphere and then carbon dioxide which gets absorbed and you produce oxygen and then animals can breathe the oxygen and all of that even those basic building blocks like stars and planets would not exist so there is a fine-tuning, a balance in the universe, and people pointed, said, that's the design. You see, the design now is no longer talked about as, look at my eye, because I can explain to you how your eye became so complex over, you know, millions of years. But I cannot explain to you why chemistry and gravity are so finely balanced. So people say, the design is over there. Maybe in the future we'll find some explanation for this, and then I will say, okay, that's not design anymore. You know, we can explain it just like Darwin was able to explain the, the complexity of life, and then people don't talk about, you know, organs and animals as uh, evidence for a creator, uh, but now people talk about the complexity and balance of the universe, but maybe tomorrow we'll be able to explain that. So that's the design argument, and these are, as you can, you can, you can see, uh, fascinating debates because they call on science. We need to understand a lot about science, but there's a lot of philosophy behind it, and there's a lot of you know, historical um, debates that people can read and find you know, fascinating, and people you know, shouted at each other and insulted each other over these arguments. So it's a lot of fun. It is definitely a lot of fun. I find all these ideas very powerful, especially the idea of the Big Bang being a point of singularity, because anything before that not existing, time not existing, or the concept of time not existing, I just find that a very powerful idea and it really sets your mind thinking. I do take your point about not wanting to impose your own uh, viewpoint or perspective because there are so many theories out there and there's so much we're yet to explore. But I do have a question for you on the topic of a creator. You've studied so many great uh, historians, so many great astronomers like Ibn al-Hetam, Ibn al-Shatir, Biruni, Avicenna, and a lot of them have uh, talked about there being a creator. So while I don't want you to impose your perspective, I would just like to ask you a, very, a personal question. You're, uh, it's optional. If you don't wish to answer, it's up to you. But has there been a moment in your life, in your work, in your research, where you've strongly felt the presence of a creator or even a god? And maybe not even felt, but experienced as an emotion, witnessed it maybe, something that you just cannot explain from the laws of physics. It had, in a way, in that moment, you felt it had to be a creator, a designer, an omnipotent being, or a very divine being? Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't mind answering, and I don't mind it being personal. Uh, you know, I'm sort of a more uh, intellect-oriented person, so I tend to look, as I said, I was always fascinated by the science and the mathematics and the, you know, the rigor of the laws and the calculations and all of that, and I found that you know, to, be, to be just absolutely amazing, and how you can do calculations, and it really corresponds to what's out there. It's like amazing. You know, I can write these simple laws and then solve a little problem. And I can tell you if you go to tomorrow over there and do this measurement and you find this is true. It's like, you know, these X and Y on your table can tell me what happens out there. That's just absolutely mind boggling. And I found that, you know, just uh, amazing and a lot of fun and, you know, that pursuit. Okay, so what else can I calculate? So I was always like that. And I thought, you know, this amazing universe is really wonderful. And as I said, the laws and their elegance and simplicity and how, you know, you have four laws in the entire universe, uh, four forces. Uh, and these forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force and the weak force. And all together, they combine to give you everything you see out there. All these diverse phenomena, whatever you can think of and observe, whether it's in the next galaxy or whether it's underground, or it's in the oceans, or it's within you, all of that is explained by these four forces. And I thought, this is incredible. It's incredibly elegant and simple and beautiful. And so to me, it was always like, yeah, I believe that there must be a creator who was you know, so powerful, put it together so simply, and let it evolve and produce this wondrous creation. 
Now, you, you asked me a different question. You said, have, was there a moment when you felt the presence of God or you, you sort of witnessed it something? Witnessed something? I did not uh, witness the presence of God in nature around me. It's like, oh my God, look at this. This is God doing this. In fact, people who know me and sometimes don't like when I say this, uh, know that I believe that God doesn't intervene in nature, doesn't go and sort of, you know, explode the Vulcan here, you know, show them how powerful I am, or let me, you know, sort of shake the ground be uh, underneath them and let, the, you know, let them see the power of God. I don't think the power of God is there. I think the power of God is in this elegance and beauty and simplicity of the universe. However, I believe there is a spirit in us. There is this other dimension in us. We are not just physical beings. We are not just, um, you know, organisms. We have mind, we have consciousness, we have spirit. Uh, and I believe, this is again a belief, I don't impose it on others. I don't say, how come you don't believe this? You know, people who say, I don't believe the earth is round, I fight them, right? But those who say, I don't really believe in the spirit, I say, it's up to you. This, I cannot force you or convince you. This is not a scientific idea. It's just a, a, a personal viewpoint, worldview. I believe we have a spirit. And this spirit allows me to sort of communicate with God or at least, you know, contemplate God and maybe be inspired or guided sometimes. And there have been some moments in my life when I felt, God has really shown me where to go. And I, and I am just absolutely amazed because, you know, there were moments when I thought, I have no idea how this is going to develop. I have no idea what to do at this moment. And, and it was all, you know, it's like we say, I leave it in the hands of God. It's like, I have no idea what to do. I just give up. You know, you, there are some moments in life where you say, I give up. I, I don't know. I've tried everything. I, I don't know what to do. And then there is some solution that pops up. Uh, which I would not have been able to, to do on my own. I would not have thought of contacting that person and that person would have a key to, to that issue or that situation. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's like a mini miracle, I call them. It's like something that pops out of, out of nowhere. Of course, it's not a miracle because no laws were violated, but it was a solution that came out completely independent of me at the moment that I needed it. So it's not, it's, people say it was just a coincidence. It was a coincidence that I needed that solution at that moment and it popped out of nowhere without my intervention and without me being able to do anything and it just solved my problem at that moment. I think, no, this is, this is God. So there were some moments like that when I felt there is a God and he or she or it or whatever we want to call him or her or it uh, has guided me or shown me to go this way or that way. A lot of beautiful points there that God is in the details, in the forces, in the symmetry of the universe and also within us. So I would like to combine all of that and also you raise the point of consciousness, which I think we can also talk about for another hour. I'd like to combine all of that into one question I have, which is going to be a hard task. <laughs> I have an excerpt from a book here. This is from the book Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. And in this excerpt, he says, In the beginning, God created earth and he looked upon it in his cosmic loneliness. And God said, Let us make living creatures out of mud so mud can see what we have done. And then God created every living creature that now moves and one was man. Man sat up, looked around and spoke. Man blinked. What is the purpose of all this? He asked politely. Everything must have a purpose, asked God. Certainly, said man. To this God says, then I leave it to you to think of one for all of this. And he went away. Which leads naturally into the question, if there is a creator, if there's a designer, then is there a purpose to all of this? Is there a purpose to the existence of the universe, to life, to the existence of man? Do you have an intuition on whether there's a purpose? Are we smart enough to understand it or whether there's no purpose at all? Yeah, uh, big questions again, and difficult questions. Uh, I, I separate the purpose of the universe or creation as a whole from the purpose of human beings. And I think, and I think those are two different things that people tend to sort of uh, uh, combine without, without realizing that they are not the same thing. Why should the whole purpose of the universe be the same as the purpose of human life or human human civilization, or human culture, human existence. Uh, and I think those are two different things. 
The purpose of the entire universe is, is very difficult for us to figure out. Um, there is evolution of the universe. The universe goes more and more complex. Uh, there's more complexity that appears. So that tends to tell me and many other people that there must be a point to all this. Why is it going, growing in complexity and more things? We humans, by the way, and life on Earth at least, did not appear until some more than 9 billion years after the start of the universe. So why would there be a universe working for 9 billion years, growing in complexity before life even starts on Earth, and then it takes another almost 4 billion years for humans, as we know them today, to appear on the scene? So clearly there must have been some other stuff going on and completely unrelated to us. Even Earth did not exist for 9 billion years. Uh, so there's, there's two different things. So there's complexity, there's a whole evolution of the universe, uh, and we can sort of try to guess that there is some long-term evolution. People have called it the omega point. There is some, maybe some, some point that the universe is tending toward, you know, sort of a final destination. The universe will reach a, you know, great unification or whatever it is. We don't know. We can speculate, but Science doesn't tell us about purpose and where the universe is going. This is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for science to figure and even for human minds and philosophy to figure. Our uh, uh, purpose as humans, this again is not a scientific question. This is a philosophical question. It's to some extent a religious question maybe for those who are religious. Uh, but we can, it, it, it doesn't make it a stupid question just because it's not scientific. But in, indeed, it's a very important question. I want to know, why am I here? What's the point of all this? You know, uh, just, you know, in the quote that you quoted from Kurt Vonnegut, you know, it's like, you know, man blinks and says, so what's the point here? What's, what am I supposed to do? Why am I here? And, 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 it's, and it's significant that that was the first question that this human, Adam or whoever, asked. Like, okay, so I'm here, so what's this? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Somebody tell me, you know? Um, because really, I mean, you ask yourself, so what am I supposed to do? What's, what's the point of all this? The, the problem, I mean, the problem, the difficulty is you have to answer it for, your, all for yourself. Of course, you can find some answers in some philosophy, in some religion, but even when you do that, you went to that philosophy or that religion and picked it and said, I will take my purpose from that religion or that philosophy. So in the end, it's your choice, which philosophy, which religion, or your own mental abilities to say, I think my purpose is the following. So for example, if you ask me, what's, what's your purpose? Why do you think you are here? And I say, my purpose is to contribute to human flourishing, to human progress, to um, growing morally, even materially, we invent more things for our betterment, for our better life, for our better existence. So that's sort of the material, scientific, technological, whatever direction. But there is another, perhaps even more important direction, and that is the moral progress. Uh, we develop human rights, we develop um, tolerance, we develop mutual respect, we develop more freedom, we develop you know, higher purposes, higher uh, ways of existing, of dealing with others, with the universe, with nature, environment, and so on. And this is what uh, human culture, human civilization, what I usually call human flourishing, human progress is about. And I think that's the purpose of our existence. If in the end of your life, my life, and I ask myself, did I contribute something even if it's two cents? Did I add something worthwhile to human civilization? If my answer is yes, then I have fulfilled my purpose. If my answer is I didn't do anything significant that I can point to, my, my life was, was a waste, uh, then, then I die very sad. Uh, and that's because I didn't fulfill my purpose. So that's, that's my view of purpose. All very powerful ideas. Uh, speaking of purpose as well, Pro uh, Professor Brian Cox in the UK, he has often spoken that humans find purpose in finding new frontiers. And in the past, it was exploring Earth, exploring the oceans, and then discovering new things. And now that we have in a way, discovered as much as we have about the Earth, even though the deep oceans are still yet unexplored. He says the next frontier for us would be our solar system, and then beyond that, naturally, exoplanets out there. So I would like to now take you to 
uh, space exploration. We are fortunate enough to stay in a country which has a very active space program. Not many countries have that. Earlier this year, UAE launched the Hope probe towards Mars, and within the same month, NASA launched the Perseverance rover. So, a lot of expeditions, a lot of adventures out to Mars right now. I want to check with you what can we discover from Mars in the coming few years that will teach us a lot more about maybe exoplanets out there and also about the existence of life. What key information can we expect to find from these probes and also future probes and rovers that we might send out that will really enhance our knowledge and also help us in our goal towards human flourishment? Yeah, just a little correction so that the viewers uh, don't think we recorded this last year. Uh, the UAE and, uh, and uh, NASA and the Chinese sent their probe last year, okay? So this was in July 2020. They arrived last February because it takes about six and a half, seven months over there. So you were, you were um, pointing to the arrival of these probes and, uh, and we are in June, just so that people <laughs> don't think, oh, this is an old conversation and they're just, you know, bringing it out. Well, Einstein said time is relative, right? So you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so why Mars and what can we discover on Mars? Well, first of all, um, even though I personally think the chances are very small, but doesn't matter what I think, uh, the main objective is to try to find any form of life on Mars. I think that's the big prize. If we find even a bacteria, if we find even a little, you know, tiny, tiny little thing, even pre-bacteria, you know, some, some complex molecule that was just, you know, trying to make something and it didn't succeed because Mars evolved in a different way, that will be extremely important. Why? For exoplanets and for Earth. Because we want to know how easily does life appear on any planet? Planet like Earth, planet like Mars. There was, if you remember, a few months back, uh, an announcement that there were some astronomers who thought that they had found uh, this gas called phosphine uh, in the atmosphere of Venus, which presumably can only be produced by bacteria. And so they said, there's phosphine, uh, you know, large quantities of phosphine in the atmosphere of, of Venus, then there must be some bacteria somewhere. And people said, wait a minute, doesn't Venus have a temperature of 450 degrees? How can you have even bacteria? And people said, yeah, 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 but we're talking about the high levels of the atmosphere where there is a layer of the atmosphere where the temperature is just about right at about 15, 20 degrees. So if the bacteria, you know, sort of escaped and went there, then maybe they are releasing this phosphine. So even in the environment of Venus, there could be uh, some primitive forms of life, bacteria or something. So we want to check. And by the way, just yesterday or the day before, NASA announced two missions to Venus in the coming, in the coming years. One of them, or at least one of them, it has this almost specific purpose of trying to, to measure these gases that are indicative of bacteria of sort forms of life. So the biggest question in astrobiology, now we call it, is uh, is there life and what form and in what conditions? Mars is very cold. Mars doesn't have, has a very, very weak atmosphere, has very patchy magnetic field. Venus has a very weak magnetic field, but a very thick atmosphere, very hot. We are in the middle. We are the perfect planet and so on. So we want to know just these three planets sort of represent the range of possibilities of exoplanets out there. Sorry, so if Professor, we find bacteria... Sorry, suppose, I just don't... I apologize for the interruption, but I just wanted to explore this point a bit further. If we do find microbial life on Mars and Venus, we've had this longest history of rumors. In the past, I believe they used to think that Venus had these grid-like patterns, very, uh, very definite lines and grids. So they thought that only a civilization could have made that. And then they found it was some kind of, I think, sulfur stream. I'm not sure that really caused it. But what I want to check with you is you mentioned microbial life on Mars. And if we do find it, that would be the biggest question that we can answer. Would you consider that good news? Because there is oh, the it, argument. It, it'll, it'll be amazing news. It'll be absolutely amazing news. Because it will mean that life can appear in different environments and more than once. Uh, some people say, yeah, but maybe it appeared on Mars. And then we know that there are some meteorites that come from Mars to Earth. So maybe life here is really the result of the original primitive forms that would have appeared on Mars if there is anything there. But if we find, if we find life anywhere else, anywhere else in our environment, even on other moons of Jupiter or Saturn, or even on exoplanets of nearby stars, 
then it will be an extraordinary development because it will mean, first of all, exoplanets were only exploring nearby exoplanets within a few hundred light years, maybe a couple of thousand light years, which is nothing compared to our galaxy, which has a diameter of 100,000 light years. So we're only exploring our neighborhood. If, suppose you go out in your, in your backyard or in your uh, neighborhood and you start to find some insects and stuff and you say, if I found insects just by going out just a few meters from my home, then there must be insects everywhere. I mean, why would the insects only live in my neighborhood, right? So there would be, that would mean that life exists everywhere in the, in the Milky Way. And why only the Milky Way? The Milky Way is just, is just a very average galaxy. Then it must exist almost everywhere. It means life appears more easily than we have thought. That's what it will mean. As I said, the chances are very low, but that would be the biggest if we discover any micro, uh, micro, microbial life or any bacteria or whatever on Mars or in the atmosphere of Venus or even in any other, on any other uh, moon of Jupiter or Saturn or uh, exoplanet, if we find any such thing in the next 10, 20 years, it will have momentous consequences. I would like to just provide context to that question because... I would also consider it good news, but why I ask, and especially if we find on moons of Jupiter, Titan and Europa, and I've got my money on Europa, but why I ask the question about good news is because there's an argument called the grid filter argument, which I'm sure you've come across, which is put forward by Nick Bostrom as well lately, where he says that if we do find life on Mars, it would be very bad news for us because that would bring the probability of finding life from one out of trillions of planets out there in the universe down to two out of nine within our solar system, which is a big jump in probability, which would then imply that the great filter that we assume, which has caused this great silence and the Fermi paradox, that is ahead of us and not before us. So that would mean that human civilization is doomed in a way. So what he said in a way, even though I find that a very cynical, very pessimistic approach, because I definitely want to find life out there, it would mean that if we do find microbial life means that the great filter is not behind us because life can emerge easily, but it's ahead of us and most civilizations will have to cross that at some point. Yeah, and why, why be pessimistic about it? It will mean, okay, be careful people. Uh, <laughs> th there is a danger. There is a probability that we will destroy ourselves uh, because life has appeared somewhere, but somehow it destroyed itself. We don't even know that for sure. That uh, even if life, if we find life on other you know, and I love Europa too, by the way, on Europa or, or Titan or Ganymede or any of them, Enceladus or exoplanets of any, um, and then we don't find more advanced life. It doesn't mean that life evolved but then destroyed itself and destroyed itself all over the Milky Way, and we are the only lucky ones so far, but we will destroy ourselves because that's what the others have done. You say, no, first of all, it doesn't mean that they all destroyed themselves. Maybe they evolved into some other form. Maybe they left the galaxy. Maybe they went underground or, you know, wanted to protect themselves from radiation. Who knows? There's all kinds of possibilities of what that means. But even if they destroy themselves altogether, why does it mean that I have to destroy myself? Maybe it will force us to be wiser, to think properly, to do it properly, and to, sign, to send outposts to send, you know, uh, colonies to the moon, to Mars, to Europa, to other places, so that even if we just destroy ourselves, we still have a little group uh, uh, on the moon, a little group on Mars, a little group on Europa, and it doesn't mean that we have to destroy ourselves. So I, I don't buy this, you know, great filter ahead of us, we're going, to, we are all doomed. I, I don't believe that. I think the more excitement we can find, the more discoveries we can make, the, uh, the, the happier we should be. Sounds great. And I think that's a great approach to have. We are winding down towards the end of our hour. So I have one big question for you and then we'll move on to our final smaller questions. And the question is, Arthur C. Clarke once said that there are two possibilities out there. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. And both are equally terrifying. And he had gone on to describe aliens and extraterrestrial as a life as magicians because there's a strong possibility they might be so far advanced in technology that they might appear like magicians to us because what they would do is basically magic. So I would like to indulge you in a thought experiment now. What is one possible form of extraterrestrial life or aliens out there that you feel is possible? Is there an image that comes to your mind? Is there something you read in a book, an idea, maybe watched in a movie as well, that you just felt this 
is a good depiction of what extraterrestrial life might look like? Is there something that comes to your mind? Yeah, that's difficult because we humans tend to think of those, you know, green beings <laughs> that have big oval eyes, you know, that kind of thing. And they're always similar to us. Maybe they have six fingers instead of five, or maybe they have pointy ears or something, but more or less, you know, 90% they are like us. Um, there's, there's a reason why we think that way, uh, other than we are simplistic in our minds, so we cannot imagine more complex. Uh, but most scientists will tell you that life has a bigger chance of appearing if it is based on carbon and if it is based on uh, complex molecules like DNA and RNA and that the cells will function pretty much the same way uh, all our cells function and that life will be similar to plants and animals and clearly animals are more complex and can develop uh, you know, maybe consciousness, intelligence more than, than plants. So. One way or another, you're bound to develop animals. And that's the easier route. So p take your pick, which is your favorite animal, <laughs> but it'll be some kind of an animal. Uh, because life is not going to just develop as a crystal or something. That's not, that's not impossible, but it's not the easy way to develop intelligence and life and sustainability and reproducing and all of that. So you're going to develop something that resembles an animal. But today we know that there are animals that are extremely intelligent, uh, like uh, these uh, uh, octopuses, for example, the cephalopods, octopus. The, uh, the ravens are extremely intelligent, we know, and they can solve problems and you know, make little tools. Uh, dolphins and whales have sophisticated uh, uh, you know, conversations and they have sophisticated songs by which they communicate and there's a lot of information in the songs and so on. So we should not, we should not be too anthropic, you know, think of ourselves as the be, uh, be end, you know, sort of um, end all, we are the thing. There could be some other forms. Um, and, you know, there, there have been some interesting uh, science fiction movies. One of them is Arrival, for example, that discussed, you know, these octopus, intelligent beings that look like octopuses and then they have a different sense of time and a different language and a different alphabet and they communicate differently. So I try to sort of expand my mind and not to think too much like, you know, those green aliens, uh, try to think of something more sophisticated. There's also the idea that because, and, and this, this is what sort of disturbs people when I tell them, I say, you know, if we find intelligent extraterrestrials out there, uh, this is why Arthur C. Clarke was absolutely right, and he's, by the way, is my favorite science fiction uh, writer, author. He said, um, you know, if we find uh, uh, intelligent aliens out there, most likely they will look like magicians, as you said, because they will have advanced so much. And why would they be so far ahead of us? And I tell people, I say, if we find any intelligent aliens out there, 99.9% .9 they are millions of years ahead of us. And millions of years ahead of us, it means they're doing stuff that for us, I mean, imagine you bring somebody from the 18th century and show them a smartphone or show them uh, a laser or show them, um, you know, a, a nuclear reactor or something. They will say, what, what, what is this? What do you mean nuclear? What's this nuclear? What do you mean laser? What's laser? What do you mean radiation? I mean, they don't even have the language for it, right? And so we would be in the same position looking at something a million years ahead of us. Um, and so it's extremely difficult to think what they will have become. And many have said they would probably have extracted themselves from their limited biological organisms and placed you know, their intelligence and consciousness or whatever into a more durable support, like a crystal or like a, you know, an, an electronic circuit or something. Why do you want this? this body which is always failing and giving me pain and I have to take medication all the time when I can take all my intelligence and everything that I need that I care about and put it in something that doesn't feel any pain, right? So could they have escaped their biological uh, origins into something more complex? It's possible, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's really interesting to think. I think there's a lot of science that comes into these kinds of questions, but there's also a little bit of speculation. Uh, that's what makes it fun. I mean, you can just speculate anything you want, but at the same time, the science 
tells you some things but doesn't tell you everything. So it leaves some room for your imagination. That's why science fiction is so wonderful. Uh, and that's the excitement of these topics. A lot of fascinating thought experiments out there. And like you mentioned, there might be planets out there which has evolved dolphins or octopuses as the superior civilizations. A lot to think about. But uh, like you mentioned, Ar Arrival. Uh, two, one movie I watched recently was Annihilation, which also had a very alien alien in a way where we did not understand at all what their motives were, what they were made of at all. And the director, Alex Garland, had intentionally wanted it in that sense. And the best movie which depicts that idea is 2001 A Space Odyssey as well, in which we don't even get to see what the extraterrestrial life is and what their motives are. They're so powerful, so advanced, so magical that you just can't imagine. So what the director wanted then as well was that no part of our perception and our understanding of life should even relate to them because they're that far advanced and it should not just be animals or humans that we understand. A lot of ideas to think about. Dr. Gesum, I would like to now move into our final questions as we start wrapping up. So what are some books, movies, or people that are very strongly influenced in your life? Uh, movies, I was smiling very broadly. I don't know if you saw me when you mentioned 2001 A Space Odyssey because that's my all-time favorite movie. It is just absolutely mind-boggling in the advanced ideas that it put forward in terms of you know, artificial intelligence and space exploration and, you know, human intelligence and interaction and what happens and what and, you know, what's this space-time thing, you know, is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, there, are, there are a number of, you know, great movies that uh, touch the mind and touch the heart uh, that tell you, you know, what do you want to... What do you want to be or who are you? You know, they sort of talk to you and they and you sit there and you think, okay, so what does this mean? Yeah, what would I, what would I have done? And uh, why did this person behave this way or that way? Um, in terms of uh, personalities, yeah, there are personalities from the past and from the present. Uh, from the past, I mentioned earlier Averroes, Ibn Rushd, who I think was sort of the, the, the perfect scholar because he combined... You know, he's, he was an astronomer. He wrote books criticizing Ptolemy. Uh, he was a, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, philosopher of that 1,000-year era of the Islamic civilization. He influenced the European Renaissance and the European, even Christian theology. Uh, he was a, a religious scholar because he was a judge. He was the supreme judge in, uh, in Cordoba, in, in Spain at that time. Uh, so, and he was a big physician. He had a book on, you know, sort of the fundamentals of medicine. So he was telling people, like, here's what you need to know about medicine. And so he had books about medicine, about astronomy, about philosophy. He explained all the works of Aristotle, and he had books on jurisprudence, on fiqh. Uh, so, and he wrote the simplest, shortest book that told people, how do you combine and make sense of all this? Just to go back to our earliest point, which was, how do you put all this together? And so it's not like, you know, separate things. It's not schizophrenia. My mind is all connected properly. So uh, Averroes Ibn Rushd is my hero because he did all of this at a time when it was possible. I don't know if it was possible to do philosophy, astronomy, medicine, jurisprudence, all of that. And to put it together so simply and neatly to tell people here's how uh, it can be harmonized. Um, other people in the, in the 20th century, I, I would like to mention maybe two people from recent times. One of them is still alive, and one of them just passed away maybe six months ago. The person who passed away about six months ago is John Barrow. John Barrow, uh, British physicist, cosmologist, and extraordinary writer. I really invite people to go and Google up his books. Uh, when I was reading his books 20, 25, 30 years ago, and then I had the chance to meet him uh, years later, I realized this man has so much wisdom because he is a top scientist, but at the same time, he's not afraid to tackle these big questions like the ones we were discussing earlier and to try to, to present them in a way that makes sense scientifically, but at the same time, you know, there is philosophical wisdom behind it. There is a human uh, understanding and human perspective to it. So I just want to sort of salute John Barrow who left us uh, at the early age of, I think he was 63 or 64 when he died about six months ago. The other person who I also know personally and have known his books for 
30 years and then was amazed to meet him and so, sort of become friends with him is Paul Davies. Paul Davies, very similar to John Barrow, has written extraordinary books, The Cosmic Blueprint, and you know, books that really sort of look at cosmology, the universe, nature, this and that, and puts it sort of in a, in a human understanding. It's not like just, you know, just equations and calculations and, you know, here's what the science says. He tries to look at it from what does it mean? Uh, so those are sort of some of the influences. I could, you know, sit here and list name after name, but just wanted to give some examples from the past and the present. What would you like your legacy to be like? Um, I think my legacy, if uh, I define myself as first an educator, so I'm a scientist, I'm an educator, I am an author, I'm a public speaker. People sometimes refer to me as a public intellectual. But my main role is really to pass on proper understanding. Education for me is not just passing on information. Now we have the internet, Google, you know, repositories of information everywhere. But Google doesn't give you understanding and the internet doesn't give you understanding. It gives you information. There's a difference between information and understanding. And my role is to explain things and help people make sense of what is out there and to think properly. So if I have achieved uh, significant or substantial success in explaining things to people, in influencing the way they look at uh, the, the world, nature, themselves, as I said, in terms of even moral progress, human rights, the place of science in our lives and so on, then I will have uh, felt I have succeeded or my life has been successful. What would you like the legacy of the human civilization to be like? Uh, moral progress. I think uh, more tolerance, uh, higher freedoms, um, big, better rights for everybody, better life, uh, harmony with with nature, the environment, the universe, more knowledge, more understanding, exploration. I think if we humans are able to, to produce more of that, and maybe just as I have students and I pass on understanding to them, maybe pass on that understanding to other species if we find them. If not, then we pass it on to some animals. Uh, then we will have succeeded in you know, playing an important role in, uh, in our, on our planet. Final question, Dr. Nidal. And I'm not sure if this has been answered partly with all the answers you give, but I would just like to ask explicitly, what do you think is the meaning of life? Uh, I think it is related to the purpose. Um, life means you have a role to play. Um, so why am I here? What does it mean if I do something? It means you have played your role properly or not. And what is your role? In my view, it is contributing to human progress, to human flourishing, to improving whatever exists on Earth for us, for animals, for the environment, for even the cosmos. Uh, so my life has a meaning if I play my role properly and I advance this purpose even one step. Beautifully put. Dr. Nidal, thank you so much for this conversation. If people want to connect with you online, in person, they want to listen to more of your work, where can they do so? Thanks so much, Shalaj. I was uh, happy and, and delighted with this conversation. Um, I hope people will find some interesting tidbits in what we discussed. Uh, and if people want to contact me, um, they can easily find my email at the, on the university website or contact me through social media. I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter every day. I have a YouTube channel. So I welcome interactions and maybe someday we'll get to meet in person in some conversation or lecture or seminar or something. So thanks again for doing this. And until next time, maybe we'll have another conversation in a few months or next year or whenever. Take good care.